Ireland is an island of connected ecosystems. Each one a wonderfully woven web of interdependent plants and animals, which have all evolved together over thousands of years. Just like on land, our rivers, lakes and wetlands contain a rich bounty of biodiversity, intricate webs of life that need to be treasured. From invertebrates on the riverbed to plants along the shore, each and every species has its own unique role in this delicate balancing act. There's a really rich insect life here, and that means there's a great population of fish. So many different plants and animals. Between that and the fish and the spectacular scenery, it's the most gorgeous place. Our welfare depends on a healthy natural environment and the services it provides. Clean water, clean air, and all the materials and foods that sustain us. But what happens when a species is lost from an ecosystem? Or when a totally new and non-native species is introduced? Can just one new arrival trigger a cascade of changes that cause other things to die out? In this episode, I want to find out more about some of the new plants and animals that are taking hold in our rivers and lakes, what kind of damage they're doing, and what we can do to stop them. My journey begins here on Loch Corrib, Ireland's second largest lake. It's a stunningly beautiful place with hundreds of secluded islands and a wonderful tapestry of habitats. But there's a problem here. An invasive plant has taken hold and it's wiping out the native plants and animals in the lake. It's even affecting the fish that make this lake a valuable tourist destination. I asked Joe Caffrey to explain to me why this plant is such a problem and what Inland Fisheries Ireland is doing about it. The invasive species were clearly adversely impacting not only on the fish but also on the habitat and then on the angling, anglers' access to our watercourses. So they had to be dealt with. And these are species that I assume are not a problem in their home territory. It's just when they, when they get here, they become a problem. Why is that the case? These are species that have arrived in Ireland without their complement of pathogens. So they can grow exponentially and there's nothing to bring them down. Here in Loch Carb, there's several quite dangerous invasive species. Yeah, we have plant from South Africa. Um, a plant with a long name called Lagerosiphon, curly leaved waterweed. This is a species we didn't want in Ireland. We knew it was in a number of ponds having been brought in by horticulturalists as an oxygenating weed for artificial ponds. We'd never seen it in the wild. So as soon as I so spotted what it was, I was in a car and down here that same day, went out to one of the bays, not that far from where we are on the lake here, just north of Uchterard and was blown away by what I saw. We had a, a bay, one of many, many good angling bays on this very large lake, and uh, I was barely able to see water. It, it blew me away, and I realised there and then we had a big problem. And you're, you're now dealing with that invasive still 12 years on. Will you bring me out to see some of it? Absolutely, I'm most certainly be more than happy to. What have we got here then? It's interesting that we have actually we've two species here. We have carophyte or stonewort. 
this is what made Loch Corrib the, the very famous wild brown trout fishery that it is. Why so? It's, it's a weed, you can see how complex the structure of the vegetation is. And as a result of that complex structure, it harbors very large numbers of insects. So this is native and it's got all these wee snails. This is a it's native. Got bugs in it. Insects that the trout particularly like to feed on. Now, you have something else here. This is the culprit. Is it? This is Lagra siphon major or curly leafed waterweed. This is the invasive species. A fragment that size or even smaller yeah. is what propagates this species. Plant breaks under the influence of wind, fragments float off, and after two or three days, water gets into the stems, they saturate, and they simply sink onto our native species, it will then grow vertically rapidly for the surface, where they can create a very dense canopy layer. They will exclude all of the light from this submerged vegetation. Submerged vegetation needs light. If it gets no light, it dies. That's how Lagara siphon achieves the success for it that it does. Amazing that it's just so quick and so aggressive. Effectively, what we're trying to do is to block light from the Lagra siphon. The Lagra siphon has blocked light from our native species and killed them because of no, there's no photosynthesis going on. We're trying to get it back. We're now laying jute matting to exclude natural light from the Lagra siphon. The jute mat has been cut to size already. The divers are making sure it goes into the right location and they also make sure that as it sinks, it goes down flat and covers all of the vegetation they need. Is this a couple of days a week or this is? This is six months work per year. Six months, this so you've got a team months. out here every day. Absolutely, half this, this year. Yes, and, and you have to do that. A huge amount of effort goes into controlling this. What would happen if somebody said tomorrow, sorry, no more budget to do this, we're, we're just gonna have to leave this? Effectively, the lake would be devastated. Angling would cease on this lake. Navigation would cease on the lake. The wetlands that fringe the lake are really special too. They have a rich web of wildlife with a unique array of insects, breeding birds, frogs and even otters. I came across this beautiful wildflower called Grass of Parnassus, which only grows in very wet places. I asked local fisherman and guide Larry McCarthy to tell me some more about the wealth of wildlife in Loch Corrib. Larry, it's really, really shallow here. We're right out in the middle of the lake. Is that one of the things that makes Loch Corrib so special? Absolutely. A lot of it is no deeper than maybe three metres, and there's an abundance of food down there. You know, the fish do extremely well. If the fish do extremely well on a lot of food, they grow bigger, they grow beautiful, and big and beautiful tanglers is what they want. So they travel from all over the world to come here. You know, Loch Corrib is, is definitely the jewel in the crown. And when it comes to wild trout fisheries in Europe, it's, it's up there as the most important. There are several threats, you know, you have pollution, you have invasive species as one, for example. Curly pondweed, Lagra siphon major, it is because we had a situation a few years back that there were several bays on the lot that were completely covered with it, blanketed. And from an angling point of view, you couldn't access them with a boat. Um, you couldn't fish because we generally fish with small flies and light line. If you did happen to hook a fish, you were going to lose it in the weed. And it's there's not... an ecological value, but there's also there's an economic value, right? Huge, huge economic value. In the region of 836 million euros comes into Ireland every year through angling. 836 and that's million yes. from angling. That's and that's amazing. recreational that's angling. Amazing. You know. <laughs> You know, it's not just the angling that's the attraction here, it's the whole ecology of the place, the whole ecosystem. We have uh, lots and lots of curlew arrives, snipe, a lot of overwintering ducks, you know, um, come 
Widgeon, Mallard, it's, it's just incredible, the ecosystem that's here. And I suppose one of the fears is that with the likes of these invasive species, you know, what's going to be the effect on all these, these beautiful creatures that we have in Loch Corrib? Because they know? come for the, the diving, they come to the, for the food that's in the lake, that's in the water. Yeah, absolutely. Now, if we affect the balance in that ecosystem, who's to say that there won't be sufficient amount of food there for these birds to make that journey? So, you know, something in the bottom in the substrate of the lake can have an effect on some of these birds that are migrating, as with, you know, the fish that swim in the water. The people that come to me from all over the world, they don't just come to experience the fishing, they come to experience Loch Corrib for what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, it's an incredible place. It's a beautiful place. It has amazing wildlife. We want to keep it that way. Anglers need to be vigilant. They need to watch what's going on. You know, um, we're custodians of this wonderful water for the people that are coming behind us. Thank you so much, Larry. You're very welcome. It's my pleasure. That was just brilliant. Great. Absolutely gorgeous. I just love exploring new habitats. And this lake really is very special. There's an intricate tapestry of life here, from the tiny bogs and the algae, right up to the otters and the big water birds. And all of these components work together in a beautifully balanced ecosystem. So when something like an aggressive, invasive alien comes in, it upsets that balance. And it sends a trauma right throughout the whole ecosystem. Coming up in part two, I'll be traveling to the Southeast to find out about a plague that's just arrived in Ireland. A plague that's wiping out our precious crayfish populations and a hermaphrodite clam that started to run rampant in the River Barrow. St Mullins in County Carlow, Pascal Sweeney, an environmental consultant, was working away on the river in 2010 when he found something that had never before been seen in Irish waters. How on earth had the Asian clam from the far east made its way here into the River Barrow? Pascal, what are you doing here? Have you found anything? <laughs> um, yes, I have indeed. This, this is one of the clams. Asian clam, as the name suggests, originally from Southern Asia. And how on earth did this get from Asia to here? It could have arrived uh, in bilge water in boats. It could have arrived uh, from somebody dumping the contents of an aquarium because they are actually sold as golden clams for aquaria. And these have become invasive then here in the barrow? Yes, they're really from this point of uh, St Mullins downstream and um, up the Nore as far as uh, Inishteag. Downstream of here, in the deeper water, the, the numbers are, were found by Inland Fisheries Ireland to be far more dense, up to 17,000 clams per square metre. 17,000. The bed down farther is just. In a square meter. Yeah, the bed down, downstream is just absolutely chock a block full of these. They are actually uh, hermaphrodite. They can reproduce by self fertilization. And once the weather gets warm enough, once the water gets warm enough, 15 degrees or, or, or more, uh, they can produce uh, 400 juvenile clams per day per clam. So you can just see why they have got such such a powerful ability to, to multiply and to be invasive. 
That is incredible. And I assume then that they're a problem because they're everywhere. There's no room for anything well, else. Well, th that is part of the problem. They totally disturb the natural fauna of a river, but also they will clog up the spawning beds of salmon and trout. Um, they will also, if they get onto, into a place where there's protected freshwater pearl mussel, they will smother the mussel, um, they will actually displace it, uh, deprive it of oxygen, and they would kill mussel, freshwater pearl mussels. So we know that freshwater pearl mussels are already really under yes. threat. There's yes. very few of them left. They're a rare species. Yep. Salmon and trout are in decline. And these, the, these, these guys could cause major, major problems. So they're here. They're also in the Shannon. And what can we do to keep them out of every river in Ireland then? Well, it's really biosecurity. Once an invasive species, for, for, uh, an aquatic invasive species gets established, um, the genie is out of the bottle. There's no going back. It's just a matter of trying to contain the problem. These clams can reproduce at an alarming rate. And because they don't have any of their natural predators here, they're wreaking havoc in the river. James and Ken from Inland Fisheries Ireland brought me downstream to another place where the clams have completely taken over. This entire mud bank is totally covered in Asian clams. They've taken over completely. I don't know how anything else here can compete with these fellas. Sometimes the problem isn't simply an invasive plant or animal. It can be something that they carry, like a disease-causing fungus. The crayfish plague arrived here in the summer of 2017, and it spreads fast. I went to meet Dr Fran Igo, who works with the local water and communities office. A fisherman told him about some crayfish in the river that seemed to be dying off, so Fran went to investigate. He looks sick. This guy here is not behaving normally. He should be able to write himself and walk off by hand. So he must be at the early stages of being infected. If this plague uh, is transferred to other catchments, we'll see this happen to the other crayfish and they'll all die off. How long did it take to figure out what the problem was? Well, the die-off was very dramatic, so it, it, straight away people were suspicious that it was uh, crayfish plague, because that's how it works, you know, you get 100% mortality and you get a big wipeout very, very quickly. So uh, Tip County Council, Inland Fisheries Ireland and National Parks, they gathered up samples and sent them on to the Marine Institute, and within two weeks they had uh, confirmation that the, um, the disease was actually this crayfish plague. They looked at the DNA and really confirmed, yes, it's crayfish plague, and that's when things really kicked in with regards to try and uh, stop its spread. In the shore, 300,000 crayfish were killed off nearly overnight. The plague probably would have spread further if there hadn't been such a quick reaction by the local water and communities office. Anglers, canoeists and all the people who use and enjoy the river were alerted. Information was put out through social media and signs were mounted all along the river. Events had to be cancelled. Because of this, it seems the disease has been contained. I really hope that everyone keeps up this effort. How did the plague get here, do we know? We don't actually know, Anya, how it got here. Um, the worst case scenario would be if somebody introduced a non-native crayfish because they're carriers of the plague. But we believe that maybe the spores themselves might have been introduced you know, with wet equipment. We don't know how. Um, and we were keen not to start pointing a finger at any particular group because essentially we all have to take responsibility and we all have to um, follow the biosecurity um, protocols. Really it's a wake up call for everybody to play their part in ensuring that you know, we protect what is unique to this country. Our 
rivers are amazing habitats. They're full of wildlife. There is loads of life. There's a mayfly, there's caddisfly larvae. There's lots of different snails. There's loads of different algae and plants. And we have one of the largest surviving populations of white-tailed crayfish in Europe. And I know that there are crayfish here. Crayfish are a keystone species. There's lots of things that they eat. There's things that eat them. So the herons and the otters all, all depend on the crayfish. If they're removed from the ecosystem, the effects will ricochet right up through the system. I really hate to think that the crayfish might be lost from a stream like this and from streams all over the country if this plague spreads. Invasive aliens are causing enormous problems in our rivers and lakes. It's really crucial that we stop them from spreading. We made a big effort to contain foot and mouth disease. The same type of approach we took then is needed now to stop these aquatic invasives from wreaking havoc in our rivers and lakes. Why am I doing this then, Martin? Well, it's very important for any water user that when they come off the water and they have, we don't really know what you could be carrying. Uh, there are so many things in water bodies that when they're moved to other water bodies, they can become a real hazard. It's really important to disinfect everything that you use, including boats, engines, trailers, uh, all fishing gear, especially before you go to another water body. Equipment like fishing rods, wellies and canoes all need to be cleaned really well so that spores or fragments of invasive plants aren't carried from one river to another. This means cleaning off mud, drying your gear properly, as well as disinfecting. All of these actions are necessary for biosecurity. Are we more vulnerable as an island to invasive species? We're definitely we're more vulnerable. We're a small country and uh, without biosecurity, certainly the potential for spread is enormous. Being a small country, these species, be they plants, be they animals, be they fish, can move much more readily and expand throughout the whole of the island. But being an island gives us a very significant advantage if we're bold enough to take it. And that advantage is we can and should be putting a ring of steel around Ireland, saying nothing in, nothing that's alien to Ireland should be allowed to get in. Regrettably, that's not the case at the moment. And uh, species are able to enter through customs and other methods. But to me, that's not good enough. Prevention is better than cure, and it's an awful lot cheaper. It's really up to all of us to play our part in keeping invasive aliens at bay. There's just so much at stake. Biosecurity is key, and failure is not an option. Mm -hmm.